Jess from Multiplicity and Me, a channel dedicated to ending the myths of DID, otherwise known as Dissociative Identity Disorder. We're also professionally recommended now! Big up to Dr Lloyd, thank you ever so much for recommending our channel, it's much appreciated. On that note, today's main topic is all about malingering. We've gotten asked many times over the years, what are the signs that somebody is faking DID? And our answer has always been the same. Unless you are actually that person, or that person's mental health expert, or a specialist in the field, you're not gonna know. And I guess that's the bottom line for this entire video from a personal and professional perspective. Okay, that's it, I'm done, bye! But let's be objective and analytical for a second and explore the research behind this. There is a checklist, so to speak, to pick up on these things. So don't just take our word for it. So most of this video will be focused on the article presented by Thomas in 2001 from the Journal of Trauma and Dissociation. And this is where the checklist was first proposed. And then we'll also round off with our personal thoughts and experiences. We also felt like the article highlighted good reason for concern. So it had like really good intentions, such as the importance of getting the right treatment for DID versus pseudo DID or factitious disorder. Because obviously either way, the person, whether or not they are faking, still needs some kind of support. Treatment outcomes, after all, are really important and they do affect everyone's well-being. The author of this has also spent over 20 years in the field of dissociative disorders and trauma, and they also specialise in diagnosing and treating the disorder. So again, really good kind of person to listen to on what is and what isn't a red flag. They first state that factitious and malingered dissociative identity disorder are particularly hard to detect. So this isn't really to be decided by us armchair psychiatrists that kind of only get a glimpse of what somebody is like online. And Thomas also notes that malingering or factitious DID is noted by wanting to assume the sick role with or without an external incentive such as economic gain or avoidance of responsibility. Specialists are required to take these kind of checklists into consideration when making a diagnosis. To rule out things like an iatrogenic disorder, so that's one that's been implanted by the therapist, or any kind of externally influenced DID. So if not done correctly, it can not only damage the patient because of the treatment outcomes, but also put the diagnostician in legal and moral dilemmas. I feel like we also have to be careful within this video not to delve too deeply into the checklist, and that's just in case somebody out there I doubt very much wants to use that to know what to say or what not to say during a diagnostic interview. So I'm gonna try and balance things and keep things vague yet informative. Say some stuff, but also miss some of the details out. Our advice going into any form of diagnosis is, of course, that all you can do is report your experiences as they happen. Don't try and fit into any boxes or, you know, look at WebMD and see what you should or shouldn't be like to fit a certain diagnostic criteria. Regardless of what the outcome is, the treatment is most important for the symptoms you're experiencing, and you don't necessarily have to have a specific label for that. So all you have to do is relax and tell the truth. So it's a 12 point checklist. Number one, differences in DES scores. The DES is a scoring test to help diagnose the disorder. It's often used for screening. Anyone scoring over 60 or more was said to be more than likely malingering. And so obviously professionals would pay extra attention when continuing to diagnose if there was a particularly high score received on the DES. Number two, reporting on dissociative symptoms. Within the study, basically, there were differences between the recall and descriptions of those with true amnesia versus the pseudo group. Um, so that's things like the depersonalization, derealization, and dissociation. People with true DID were able to give examples of these issues, and those with the pseudo DID generally struggled. Identity alteration was also exhibited between real patients of DID versus those without. Number three, able to conceptualize and have a good chronological idea of time. That kind of speaks for itself as DID does impact memory. Personal self-reference and expression of effect. 
So this basically means there was a lack of consistency and some expressions didn't really make sense in their placement with the fictitious group. Number five, expression of very strong negative effect. This means quite simply that people with pseudo DID really were able to strongly convey their emotions without kind of any inhibitors. Number six, objects brought to the consultation. These can say a lot. So some people were bringing their diagnostic papers and other bits and art and whatever else. Although some of the items brought to the sessions kind of overlapped between genuine and disingenuine DID. Seven and eight kind of overlap too. So seven is self-disclosure of alleged abuse, symptoms or diagnosis to people. And number eight is the disclosure of alleged abuse that came up during the consultation. So people with genuine DID tended to only volunteer a general statement about what happened to them, i.e. I went through physical abuse, I went through sexual abuse, um, I was neglected and an inconsistent medical history was also found within those with a fictitious DID versus those with true DID. Number nine is presence of shame and guilt and suffering. So this paid importance to the way that people presented and felt about their past. The pseudo group essentially didn't express these feelings in the right way when discussing their history and symptoms. So number 10 is the involvement in community and self-help groups, which I find comes as quite a shock really. I figured that most people would kind of seek help and support online but again I can understand why that shame and also again the amnesia may prevent that from happening. So it stated that a lot more people in the fictitious group were a lot more involved in the self-help groups. As this study was back in 2001 as well it would be interesting to see if there are any changes to this now. You know there's more awareness online, people are talking about it more, but then again, does that statement ring true because there's more awareness about it and more people kind of want to get involved and yeah. Number 11 is the presence of post-traumatic symptoms. Even when the pseudo group describes their symptoms of PTSD, basically their symptoms didn't fit and didn't marry up with the diagnosis. There was like that lack of consistency. Whereas for the genuine group, the re-experiencing of trauma sort of came up again and again and with a certain comorbidities, that then reflected the true representation of PTSD, which is found within DID, obviously. So number 12, finally, is motivation for consultation. So I'll read this to you guys. So this is what it says about the pseudo group. Three people appear to use DID diagnoses to avoid responsibility. Two people have their identity and social network wrapped up entirely in being part of a multiple personality group or a survivor support group in their respective communities. Both were referred because their therapist felt stuck in therapy and as a previous trainee psychotherapist like to me that would also be an indicator that the treatment is incorrect it doesn't fit that diagnosis it also says another developed symptoms after being in close proximity with someone with DID and another few needed to maintain long-term disability benefits so therefore we're after the label. That sounds horrible, doesn't it? There were, however, different motivations for those with a genuine disorder. Of course, that speaks for itself. When you go on to read the discussion of the article, basically authenticity and consistency appear to be the overarching theme and also a push to prove legitimacy of somebody having the disorder um, is not within the normal realms of someone apparently with genuine DID. It also says quite a high amount of people um, do not have genuine DID. So they say around 10% of those seeking a second opinion of a diagnosis have simulated DID. And out of these 12, a person needs to demonstrate eight or more out of 12 to be considered factitious DID. And it says then that the genuine cases often tick around three of those boxes. And while the paper itself draws some really strong conclusions, the main downside is the small and selective population that was interviewed overall. So two very important questions. One, can you spot a faker? And two, what do you do if you feel like you're faking? So I'll say again, unless you are that person or you're in that specialist field, the answer is probably not. What can you do about it though? If you're adamant somebody's faking, what can you do? My personal opinion is to separate yourself and create that boundary and that distance to not reward their actions. You might be right, you might be wrong, but at the end of the day, you can't do anything about their actions and your comfortability is the most important thing. And if that person makes you feel awkward, you can take a step back. I'd be lying if I didn't say we've come across people in our time that come across as either disingenuous with their disorder or who quite frankly seem to role play it. And yeah, you know, I think that 
to me has been quite offensive but then again that person is only showing a side that they want to show online that may not necessarily reflect how they are in person 24 7. For that reason alone I would never call somebody out for it because I'm not in their head, I don't see them 24 7 and I am not their therapist. We can still have those thoughts and feelings about somebody else, that is a valid way to feel. But in regards to actions, it's not okay to shame either. And for some of the research that's done on sort of pseudo and fictitious disorders, it says actually that confronting a person aggressively or shamefully actually makes matters worse. You need to gently state that it's okay. And regardless of whether or not someone has it, of course it could be played up for gain. Support and validation seeking are legitimate human occurrences, so it's not unheard of to play up your symptoms. We're all human. So two, what do you do if you feel like you're faking? I'd say be honest with yourself. Do you have a gain or do you feel like you're doing or saying some things to fit in and feel a part of the community? Have you or are you receiving treatment or is there a reason perhaps you're avoiding treatment? Those are the questions you kind of have to be honest with yourself about. Sometimes as well, like I know full well, that that mixture of dissociation, derealization, depersonalization, amnesia kind of all mixed together and kind of create this wall between I experience this and I don't remember experiencing this. Yesterday was a lie, my whole life is a lie. And that's also genuine and fine. Some parts may not acknowledge they have the disorder whilst other parts do. Sometimes it flip flops and again, that's fine. In those times, I would say to you kind of bear with those feelings until it passes or speak to your mental health professional who may be able to kind of guide you and help you rationalize. Equally, if you're watching this and you feel like you need permission to own your truth or own your reality and kind of accept those feelings, then yeah, it's okay. Here's your permission. It's okay to have that reality that perhaps this disorder doesn't encompass what you've actually experienced. I know. Uh, the boys have been saying a lot lately, you can't fit a square peg in a round hole if it doesn't fit, if your symptoms don't fit, don't try and make it fit. Just be you and that's all you can be. The most important thing is to be true to you. And that is another puzzle piece together. So what have we learned? One, that there is a checklist that exists, of course, for all specialists to make and ensure that they are going to diagnose somebody correctly. Two, some people bypass that, but evidently or course should not be shamed for it because whatever they're experiencing is clearly something. Three, either gently approach someone or distance yourself from that person if you feel uncomfortable about their displays of DID. Four, it's okay to be honest and it's okay to get help um, regardless of whether or not you have DID. Five, we are not in somebody's head, we are not their specialist and therefore it is wrong for us to judge or call anyone out. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you're keeping well and keeping safe in these very strange times. Okay guys, speak soon.